Father, we give you thanks that you are the God who gives life and you give life to the fullest. And you've called us to yourself. And we pray, Father, that this day, as we open up your word and study your word, your Holy Spirit would bring about conviction in our lives of the changes that you want to make so that we can be all that you want us to be, so that we can experience life eternal and life to the fullest the way that you designed it for us. So, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be speaking and changing us this day as we take your word and apply it to our lives. May we be different because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the things that uh, I really appreciated about spending time with my dad is that he would always expose me to things that I wasn't necessarily used to, and sometimes things I didn't like. Now, I remember Dad being a NASCAR fan growing up, and I just didn't get the, the, the NASCAR. I didn't get running around the, the track and the circle, but Dad loved NASCAR. So when we came back from being overseas, and I was in seminary in South Carolina, Dad wanted to do something, some father-son things, and I love spending time with Dad. And so when he invited me to go with him to Darlington Racetrack for the Darlington 500, I said, yeah, I'd love to go. And when I went to that racetrack, there was something that just really surprised me and made a mark and an impression on me. We were sitting in the grandstands, and all of a sudden, the roar of the engines were just overwhelming. I mean, it's not like some of these street racers where they, they take off their mufflers and they go, and makes that loud and annoying noise. This was the power of the engines. I mean, our whole bodies were vibrating from the power of the engine as the NASCAR uh, uh, vehicles were going around. They're called stock cars, which means that they should be something that you would just buy off the lot stock. But... You know, these are cars that didn't have the governors or the restrictor plates. They didn't have the mufflers that were, were, were keeping the sound down. And it was impressive when you would f hear the roar of the engine and feel the vibration. You had to literally have on headphones so that it didn't make you deaf by the end of the race. You know, I think uh, in our society, often there have been times when uh, there's been a suppressor of truth where there's been a desire to, to, to squash the, the loud voice of truth that is uh, proclaiming, attempting to suppress a voice that could make a difference in this world. You know, as uh, uh, Elder Manuel mentioned, this is the Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. Uh, tomorrow will be Martin Luther King Day. And in 1963, uh, there was a march on Washington in the context of, and, uh, and, and so... And that was the context of the March on Washington was when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his very famous I Have a Dream speech, which was talking about liberty and dignity for all people. And so tomorrow there's going to be a celebration of this man who was a, a speaking out truth in, a, in, his, a, uh, in his time. On Friday, this, uh, just uh, uh, two days ago, there was a march on Washington, D.C., a march for life. As people we're marching to protect the unborn. And today is Sanctity of Life Sunday, where we honor the human life and the protection of the unborn. You know, and it's not just those big events where the voice of truth must be proclaimed, and there's often an attempt to suppress the voice of truth. It can't be silenced. But we see that God speaks to this issue about proclaiming truth. And there's a relevant message for us today with very practical uh, implications for us as we live in the last days. The verse that we're looking at today as we continue in our study in 1 Thessalonians is uh, chapter 5, verses 19 through 22. So if you have your Bibles or devices, you could turn with me as we, we read that passage, but you can follow along on the screen. 19 through 22 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Once again, we have a very short passage that we're dealing with this week. Like last week, we examined the three radical do's for living in the last days. As a, in a, to live in a dependable way, we, we saw that we are uh, to, the radical do to rejoice always, to pray without season, ceasing, and to give thanks in every circumstance. You know, actions that, flow, that would flow from a, a desperation, deep desperation and deep understanding. And this week we're going to see the other side of that coin. We're going to see three radical don'ts. 
Uh, and the main idea today that I want you to take away as we consider these three radical don'ts is that radical restraint of self-will releases the Holy Spirit's power to accomplish God's will. So radical restraint of our will, what we want to do, because God has given us the ability to choose and the will, but if we radically restrain our will in order to release the Holy Spirit's power to accomplish God's will, we will see God do amazing, amazing things. As we look at this idea of three radical do's today, we're going to look at three concepts. and We're going to see a living as we seek to live dependable lives in the last day, there's the first radical don't, excuse me, the radical do's and the radical don'ts. So if I misspeak, you know we're talking about the radical don'ts today. Uh, we, uh, the first radical don't that we're going to examine today is don't stop the fire. Don't stop the fire. Uh, and we see that in verse 19. It says, do not quench the spirit. You know, the word quench means to stifle or to suppress. In the same way that a muffler suppresses the sound or, or a silencer or suppressor it, uh, diminishes the, 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 the recoil from a, a firearm that's fired, it says don't stop the fire, don't quench the spirit, don't suppress what the spirit of God is doing. And so the way that we look at don't stop the fire, we want to make sure that we don't stop the fire of revival or the fire of holiness. See, these are the don'ts, the radical don'ts, because in the world today, there's often a question of living a radical life, or do I want to live a status quo life? So when we think of the importance of not stopping the fire, or stopping the fire of the re revival, it, we need to, it really begs the question of what is, why would people try to put out the fire of God? Uh, why would there be a suppression of the things that the Spirit of God of, of doing is the, that the Spirit of God is doing. You see, there's a danger of dousing the fire when the Spirit begins to move. When the Spirit brings conviction, there is a danger of moving in a way that's going to put out the, the fire of revival, the, the life giving work that the Spirit of God is wanting to do in our midst. Well, why do people consider putting out this fire of revival? It begs this question of why do that? And I think that people often would, are willing to put out the fire of revival because there's a fear of destroying the familiar. You know, wanting to maintain the status quo or wanting to maintain control is what, how it comes that we put out the fire of revival that God wants to do in our midst. We see this taking place among the Pharisees in Jesus' time. They wanted to maintain the status quo. They were afraid of Jesus because he was stirring the pot. He was not letting life go on in the same dysfunctional way. He began to address things. And so the Pharisees were afraid of Jesus destroying the familiar, so they, put out, they tried to put, squash him down and put out the fire of revival that Jesus was bringing in their midst. 1,500 years later, we see that taking place again within, the Christi within Christianity. As a young Roman Catholic priest named Martin Luther saw that there were things that were going on in the church that were not normal. And he wanted to create a revival so that there would be a return to the Word of God. But there was fear of, the status quo, a fear of change in the status quo, a, a fear of change that there might be undermining the ecclesiastical authority of the time that was contrary to the Word of God. And so there was opposition to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation that was birthed under Martin Luther. You see, there's a spirit of revival that the Spirit of God is wanting to do constantly and regularly in our midst so that we can be revived, refreshed, and living into the fullness of our identity in Christ. And so that's why this, the Word says, do not quench the Spirit. Do not put out, do not suppress the fire of the Spirit of God which brings about Revival. I think that there's also the fear of uh, not only destroying the familiar, but there's a fear of igniting the uncontrollable. You know, when there's a fire of revival, it's, we want to control it. We like fire in a fireplace. We don't like fire, wildfire, because it has potentially destructive uh, uh, impacts. 
We want to manage the unknowable and we want to manage the things that we don't understand. So often when we deal with the Holy Spirit of God, we want to put the Spirit of God in a nice tidy box where we can control him and make him do what we want him to do rather than letting the Spirit of God impact us and change us so that we become what he wants us to be and do what he wants us to do. No fear of initiating the uncontrollable. If I yield control of my life to the Spirit of God, He may make changes in me. And those changes might make me feel uncomfortable. And so I'm reticent to do that. You know, I think of the challenge for why people don't want to see revival. Christians don't want to see revival because, and they want to suppress the Spirit of God because they're f- afraid of the uncontrolled work of the Spirit in our midst is because they don't want to be viewed as religiously extreme or radical. You know, we w- they want to maintain the status quo, but God calls us to a life that is radical, a life that is extreme because, not because we're weird, but because we are living into the truth of God's Word, which has the power to change us, and has the power to change our society. It has the power to take a person who is bound towards destruction and separation from God in eternity and hell and turn them into a child of God destined for eternal life and having purpose and meaning. So sometimes we want to, to quench the Spirit of God in the fire of revival because we don't want to be viewed as re- extreme or radical. But also we don't want to be uncomfortable Because the Spirit of God in making revival may lead us to take action, to speak, to do, to go, to be. It might turn up, uh, it might, uh, 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 there's a word in French, I can't think of the word in English now, bouleversé. I I hate it when that happens, I I, I forget the English word. But it's to to create a problem in our life and my plans is is it's turbulence is the the word I I, I think that I'm looking for in English. I'm sorry, that might strike you as weird that a guy who speaks English can't remember words in English, but it it happens sometimes. Um, But we might have plans, and if we're uh, allowing the Spirit of God to work, He can change our plans. I think of when I went away to college. I had a plan. My plan was to be an engineer. And then my sophomore year, I came into a personal relationship with Christ, and my plans were turned upside down. And he ended up calling me into the mission field to be a missionary and serve overseas. I didn't have any public speaking skills, but when I came to Jesus, I was given spiritual gifts and the ability to communicate. And so he called me in a completely different direction. It overturned my plans. But the thing is, is I wouldn't go back and change that for anything because the Spirit of God and the fire of revival is not only for my good, but for His glory. And when we understand that, we are willing to yield control so that the Spirit of God, who cannot be controlled, can achieve His purposes in us individually and in our midst together corporately. I think of the wildfires of the giant redwoods out west. We see the wildfires burning out there and it can create great devastation. But it's interesting that the wildfires are necessary because of those giant redwoods require a certain temperature for the the seeds to explode. And so there cannot be multiplication of the giant redwoods unless there is a wildfire hot enough to explode the seeds. We want to be, allow the Spirit of God to operate like a wildfire in our midst, creating fire seeds of spiritual revival, which will impact us and impact our lives, impact our churches, and impact our communities. Well, it's not just about the fire of revival. It's about a fire of holiness as well, because revival can't take place unless holiness takes place, and it begins among God's people. One of the things that we Christians often do, which we shouldn't do, is we demand holiness of a world that doesn't know Jesus. That doesn't make any sense. A non-Christian is going to act like a non-Christian. But we as Christians are the ones who are called to holiness because our identity is in Christ. And so therefore, Christ needs to, uh, work of holiness needs to be produced in us so that we can be the context and the means through which God's Spirit produces revival. Drawing people to himself because we are living holy lives that are attractive to a world that is watching. I think of two um, people throughout history that really, when I think of holiness, they come to mind. The first is John Wesley. He lived from 
1703 to 1791. And when he was at Oxford as a fellow there, he formed holy clubs for the purpose of study and pursuit of the devout Christian life. Now it's interesting, at his holy club at Oxford, there was another uh, young minister. His name was uh, George Whitfield. And, and he was part of John Wesley's Holy Club. Now it's interesting that they were united together in holiness even though their theologies went different directions. Wesley was more Arminian and, and he went in one direction and Whitfield was more Calvinist and he went in another direction. But they were unified in the person and work of Jesus Christ and they saw the importance of holiness in the individual's life. And so they didn't let a doctrinal uh, difference within Orthodox Christianity create a division. They saw the holiness of Jesus as being important. I think of some great quotes from John Wesley about holiness. He said, I continue to dream. He had a dream too, before Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. He said, I continue to dream and pray about a revival of holiness in our day that moves forth in mission and creates authentic community in which each person can be unleashed through the empowerment of the Spirit to fulfill God's creational intention. You see, Wesley understood that holiness leads us into purpose, mission, and community. Holiness is the precursor for revival. He also made some astute observations about our cult the culture of his day, which can extrapolate out and apply to culture our day. He said, vice does not lose its character by becoming fashionable. Just because something becomes popular and fashionable doesn't mean that it's less negative as a vice. And he goes on to say that one gener what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. He said this in the 1700s, people. <laughs> what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. And so we, as God's people, are called to be a holy people, a holy generation. We need to live in holiness according to God's word. And we don't tolerate something today which is going to be an accepted in the next generation to the detriment of our children and those who follow behind us. Another great person of, of uh, speaking of holiness is the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, A.B. Simpson. He said he uh, lived from 1843 to 1919, so we saw the, the 18th century, the 19th century. And, and, and as you know, A.B. Simpson talk, taught about knowing Christ as our sanctifier. And he talked about the, both the process and the crisis of sanctification as we are becoming holy. He said, had a few quotes that I thought were very important as well. He said, one thing must be avoided at all cost. We must not let the world seep into the church. When we let the world dilute our gospel and water down our values, we'll disappear from sight. Let's keep the church holy and wholly committed to Scripture. We have to hold high the Word of God and be submitted to the Word of God not out of a traditional sense, but because it is the Word of God. And God's Word never goes out of style. It never goes out of vogue. It never goes out of fashion. It is always relevant and powerful to change us and relevant for where we are. If you haven't read the Bible, I would highly encourage it because as you read the Bible, Scripture addresses things that we deal with each and every day. It's, it's relevant for our situation today. Simpson went on to say that the chief danger of the church today is that it is trying to get on the same side of the world instead of trying to turn the world upside down. You see, the life of holiness is something that will turn the world upside down, the fire of holiness in our lives. May God fill us today with the heart of Christ that we may glow with divine fire of holy desire, Simpson says. So don't stop the fire the fire of revival, or the fire of holiness by quenching the Spirit. The second radical don't that we will consider is don't hate the unusual. Verse 20, um, uh, Paul writes, says, do not despise prophecies. Now this is interesting because the word despise means to, to make of no account or not take into consideration. 
And this begs the question, you know, why do some despise prophecy or why is prophecy sometimes despised? Well, I think that the reason, you know, in, in, the, in the church today, this is a very controversial topic of, of prophecy. But Paul says, don't despise prophecy. And I think part of the reason that there's some, some, some uh, uh, shields and guards up with regards to prophecy is because there are so many charlatans out there. People will say anything. They will be abusive of, 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 of speaking for God and, and give a prophetic word in a manipulative type of way. But Paul says, do not despise prophecy. So let's look real briefly uh, at why not we shouldn't hate the unusual is by understanding the nature of prophecy. Prophecy uh, really relates to two major areas. First is there's the prophetic um, foretelling. Um, it's a Kind of like the predictive aspect. It's the elephant in the room. You know, it's awkward related to prophecy. Who can foretell the future? And if I say I know the future and it doesn't take place, well, that's kind of awkward. So this foretelling can be a little bit of a, a challenge sometimes. But the, the foretelling aspect of prophecy, we need to understand that uh, it's, it's, there's a purpose of prophecy that God used, and that was to make people aware, to inform them about coming events. The foretelling of prophecy was to reveal things. And so we see these prophetic words where God is forewarning, foretelling, and revealing. And that's one aspect of prophecy. But there's also the danger uh, of prophecy. And, and Matthew 7.15 talks about that. He says false prophets and, and, and false prophecy will contradict scripture, scripture in the last days if we allow it, if we allow the person to go on. So it's not just... Uh, personal advice or personal opinions under a, a spiritual veneer that we have to look out for. We have to, to make sure that we are aligning with the Word of God as we consider any prophetic word, but at the same time, we're not to hate, despise, or dis diminish prophecy. The second nature of prophecy is not the foretelling, but the forth telling, speaking forth the truth of God's Word, boldly highlighting what Scripture says, even if it's not popular. So this aspect of prophecy is declaring, saying that there is judgment that is coming. Therefore, we need to repent, that we are accountable, that God loves you, that Jesus is the only Savior. And so there is the foretelling. It's bold. And sometimes it's not popular. So when we have to say that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, Scripture will declare that sometimes our actions are wrong and we need to make adjustments to how we live. And that's not fun. But that is the value of prophecy. And that's why Paul says don't despise prophecy because when we're boldly speaking forth the truth of God's Word, it's going to make us feel uncomfortable sometimes. You know, I stand up here every week and I preach and all I am doing is preaching to myself and hoping that some of y'all will receive the benefits. I am, as I prepare the word of God, I'm coming under conviction of things in my life that God needs to, to fine tune and tweak so that I'm aligned with the word of God and that he's making transformation in me so that I'm continually growing into the image of Christ, even as we saw in the adult enrichment class this morning. And so there's the, the nature of prophecy. But we also can see that there's great value in prophecy. You know, as we align, because prophecy will help us to align with the Word of God for guidance. You know, in this world, we are looking to know where we're going. We need guidance. And, and the, the, the forth telling of God's Word, hearing God's Word spoken, studying God's Word, will help give us the guidance that we need. Often I will find Christians that say, I don't know what God wants me to do. And I say, well, have you been reading God's word? Well, well, no. Well, then how will I know what God wants me to do if I'm not in tune with his word and reading his love letter to me? It's through reading his word that the word of, that the, the, reading the word of God, that the spirit of God can give me direction of how I can apply that word in a given situation. And so that's important. Alignment with the word of God and guidance comes through as the benefit and value of prophecy, but also the timely encouragement from the Word of God is another benefit of prophecy. You know, sometimes it's not about the foretelling or, or something that we don't know, but it's just the, the, a prophetic word could be a word that has been revealed in the Word of God, 
appropriately and timely given to a person at their point of need. You might not even know what that need is, but God is, is laying something on your heart from the Word of God to speak to a person. And so there's no new information, but it's the timely application of information. So therefore, don't despise prophecy. I think of, uh, I'm going to read a, a, a letter. I got permission from my friend. His name is Russ Licht, and uh, he went through a very, he is a, a cancer survivor now. I think I mentioned him in a message about a year and, uh, uh, soon after I arrived here because he was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of uh, leukemia. He had a very low survival rate percentage, and his uh, transplant was successful, and he is, is still alive. And he wrote in the Caring Journal, uh, Caring Bridges pages, the following in his response to this. He goes, I see threads from several blog posts you have read before um, being woven into a tapestry. My mind is clearing. I'm remembering with purpose there's a pattern emerging. You prayed fervently uh, as Joanne posted faithfully. And we can look back now and see how God answered each of those prayers. Not one was ignored. And they were big prayers. It took faith to pray against all odds for me daily because he had a very aggressive form of leukemia. He goes, I was praying for much simpler things. Lord, help me to swallow the next bite. Lord, help me to brush my teeth tonight without gagging. Lord, help me go to the bathroom. Father, help me to sleep just a little bit. Please take away the phantom smell. I pray dozens of times daily, but for all the little things, the big stuff like healing and survival, I left to you and was very comforted to know that others were lifting the heavy burdens because I couldn't. I could only handle moment by moment, hour by hour, and that was all the strength I had. And then he says, this helps explain the vision I had on the first night after diagnosis. The room was large, with wall-to-wall -wall windows, looking over the city of Orlando. I was comforted to see life going on outside my secluded place. But when I closed my eyes, I saw a wall instead of a window. The wall was thick and strong, without top or bottom and no sides. It was living and active. Objects were moving inside of it. And God said, that wall is the prayers, love, and well wishes of your friends and family from all over the world. That wall will protect you. I was very aware that he did not say I would be healed, but only that I would be protected. He also said, it's not about you. And then about two hours of trying to pray, I could not form full sentences in my mind. Some ideas escaped me before I could grasp them. But it was a conversation nonetheless. I was experiencing Romans 8, 26 and 27, where the Spirit intercedes on your behalf. And finally, I slept peacefully. You see, don't hate the unusual. My friend had a vision related to the intercession of the prayers and how God was using that to encourage him. And, and when I heard that, that encouraged me to be faithful in praying when I don't see and I don't know. And so it really relates back to the past message of pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Give thanks in all circumstances. Don't despise prophecy. Don't quench the Spirit. But in addition to the two radical don'ts that we saw, we see a third radical don't, and that is essential living into the last days, and that is don't believe everything. Scripture says in verse 21, test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. You see, testing protects us from both the deception of non-resisting and also from the skepticism of overly resisting what the Spirit of God is doing. You see, we aren't called to believe everything. We're called to be discerning. We're called to test everything and then hold on to what is good and then abstain from every form of evil. You've heard it say, you may have heard the phrase say, just believe. I don't ever ask you to, to just believe. Don't, I don't ask you to take a blind leap of faith. I ask you to take a 
an informed leap of faith because we believe in the Word of God and we believe that the Spirit of God is living and active and moving. And so we engage based on the truth of, of the Word and the person of Jesus Christ. We have discernment. And discernment is not in opposition to faith. i got a question. Who here believes every story that you read on the Internet? If you're raising your hand, I want to have a talk with you afterwards. <laughs> Do you believe every testimony of the miraculous? Well, to be honest, I don't because there are manipulative charlatans out there. But do you reject every testimony of the miraculous? And that is no because our God, the God of the Bible, is the God who is active and working in people's lives. So we see the, the, the instructions in this big third radical don't of don't believe. It says be discerning, test everything, examine them carefully is what we're called to do. And then we hold fast to what is good, to keep secure, have a firm possession on the truth that we encounter. And then abstain and reject every form of evil. Keep away, hold back, keep that evil off. And as we think of this weekend as the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial uh, weekend, weekend, he was a man who was a visionary, had a prophetic view of the future with the dream where there would be unity, racial unity in our country. I think that was a prophetic view that he had. So don't despise prophecy. And we also see that we are not to quench the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is moving in our midst, and we are to reject all forms of evil as we hold on. And the Sanctity of Life Sunday is a call for us to reject the form of evil of abortion. Abortion is evil. With more than 50 million babies that have been killed in the womb since 1973, we have to take a firm stand for truth and righteousness according to the Word of God. This is not a political issue. This is a moral issue. And we need to abstain from every form of evil and call out the evil of Planned Parenthood that is responsible for the sole, single largest provider of abortions in this country. That is not political. That is a moral statement based on the truth of God's Word, the giver of life, and the sanctity of life that he gives us. So the main idea, once again, is radical restraint of self-will releases the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's will. And so we need not to despise prophecy. We need not to quench the Spirit. But, and we need not believe everything, but submit our wills to the will of God so that we're transformed in holiness and we can be a transformational impact in the society around us. So what's your next step? What's my next step? Well, the question is, are we broken over our sin? Are we responding with deep conviction that the Spirit of God is moving and calling us to examine ourselves and to repent of any sin in our life that is not aligning with the truth of God's Word? In our attitudes, our actions, our words, are we aligning with Jesus? Because I want you to hear this and I want you to understand, wherever you are, God is ready to meet you at that point with His amazing grace. He extends an offer of grace to each and every one of us, whatever our situation, whatever our struggles may be. And He loves us so much that He calls us to repentance in a transformed life. So let us yield our wills, wills to him that we might experience his power. Let us pray. Father, we can't do this on our own. It's so easy for us to, to be okay with the status quo when you call us to a lifestyle that is radical. And in this world that is becoming radicalized, you call us to be radical in holiness Radical in truth, radical in kindness, radical in gentleness, radical in grace, even as we stand firm on the truth of your word and on the work of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us to be lights. Help us to align our hearts with you and to yield our wills to you that you might move in us and through us for your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. 
We ask as well, Father, that you would draw people to yourself. And if there is someone here today who has never received Christ, I pray that you would help them through the prophetic word, the foretelling of the word that has taken place today, to draw them to yourself that they might have eternal life and become your children. Thanks, Father. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.